Ash 8810. You are the first. You get a wave. Welcome, welcome. Hello, K. M. McGivney, Mr. Picture Maker, Diego Allegre, J. Perry Hill, Hippie 3, Hippie 306. I'm curious about that one. I'm just playing a little, doing a little crowd work with the usernames. And so far, ooh, Fabulous Franny B. That's that's a good one. Because you put the, again, when people put the emotion or the like rating system, username, Suzette Pauly, hello, good to see you. Florida's in the house. All right, all right. And uh, let's see, Myers Sleeve, Myers Sleeve. Oh, hit me with the hit me with the Vulcan. Yes. Yes. Um I don't Meyer sleeve. That's kind of it feels like a code name of some kind. Deke from Philly. What's good, Philly? Felix the Cat. That's a name I recognize. Felix the Cat, but 32. What happened to the first 31 cats cuz cats have 9 lives. So I'm doing cat math right now and I still don't know how you get to 32. How do you get to 32 cats? You got to break that DM me. Let me know. Let me know or just pop on the screen and explain to us. I might regret that. I make films joined. See, that's what I'm talking about. That's a name that also has a message and you can say it. Like, what's your, where do I find you? Uh, I make films. What's your using? Uh, I make films. But what's your name? No, I make, fi you know what I'm saying? It's like a who's on first kind of opportunity that you've created. Uh, so I really much love to you. Oh, and I look fancy. Thank you for noticing. Thank you, Jen Nickel, one of our regulars. Welcome back to Club IG Live, live on lockdown. Uh, Jen Nickel's been with us many times, so it's good to, good to see your name pop up again. I am looking fancy because I was inspired by my friend Sohani, who I did a Zoom call with earlier this week, and she was looking pretty fly. And I was like, why? I'm in calls all day. I'm not trying to look that cute. Nobody else is trying to look that cute. Nobody's got good lighting. Why you look so good? What's, what? And she's like, I put on lipstick. I tried like I maybe made up my face and one of her friends was like going through her whole closet and intentionally wearing outfits that she owned. And so I just started since Monday, like going deeper into the closet because I had just been on this cycle of like sweatsuits. Like y'all know you've been on the sweatsuit cycle, the coronavirus sweatsuit cycle where you're like, okay, today I'm rocking the new balance. I'm going with the going with the Navy and black new balance. And I could probably wear that two days in a row in different sets of zooms and nobody would even know. And then I'll switch over to the Target tracksuit that my boo got me and I could probably rock that. But I'm going to take a, a hike in that or like a walk. So I'm going to get sweaty. So I can't wear that too often. And then I just go with the sweatshirt, sweatpants, but like independent, you know, not coordinated. But people don't see the legs. So anyway, yes, Jen, I'm uh, the, the fanciness is on purpose. Uh, in-ear monitors. <laughs> yeah, again, I got a microphone. I got the in-ear. You know, this is a, it's a show. It's a show. It's a show. Democracy check. What's up? I like democracy. Check. Okay, is that how that works? Did I just give us more democracy when I checked your name like that? Oh, good, good, good. Um, and let's see. Oh, and I, uh, do you know, Philly. Okay, good. thank you all for checking. Oh, the mic seems a little hot. Thank you. You know, probably not just that the mic is hot it's probably that i'm talking too loud i have what's known as old person cell phone audio boost built in where if i'm on like a speakerphone call or a cell phone call or any kind of communication with another human nowadays because they're all through these devices i just scream and i get real animated and someone who i love and live with that often has to tell me like yo you don't need to like they're right there they're just right there so thank you, Mashak. I turned the gain down a little bit, and I'm going to try to turn turn it down a little bit in here, but not in the heart, just in the, in the vocal cords. Uh, all right, welcome, welcome. So good sweater, Uncle. Yes, this is an Uncle sweater. This is a double-breasted navy blue. I don't know where it's from. We could, we could look at the tag together. I feel like it's a top man type situation. This is It's got some age on it. Good, good, good. Okay. Well, here's what we are going to do. Nobody gives you the light on live. That's a, that's true in the club. Uh, are you about to break out in song? What's up, Erica in Philly? Hello. Very good to see you. 
Uh, no, it is not my intention to break out in song. Um, those intentions can change, but that is that is not what we're <laughs> that's not what we're here for. Though I do feel like I'm set up in this sort of crooner type situation where you know you just turn it like to the side a little bit. You know, you lean into the camera, right? Make that eye contact right with the lens. So I'm only talking to you and you alone. I could probably, if I had a black and white filter to throw on it, hold up. Let's see what we can do. Let's have some fun. What about, that's not what I thought it was. That's also not what I thought it was. Ooh, there's, no. But this one's kind of, yes, this could be like, a, right? <laughs> All right, cool. Let me just stop with that nonsense and turn that down. Go like this. Okay. Mark McIntosh, what's up? Jamaica in the house. Thank you for popping through. This is great. <laughs> no need to turn it down. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you caught those eyelashes. That's good. That's good. So here's what's going to uh, happen now. I have arranged some thoughts to share. Um, and uh, I also asked before the show, and I will encourage you now, you are, you're tuned in to episode seven of Live on Lockdown, a show that I make every Sunday, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern uh, on Zoom. And to get that invite, just click my profile link when this is all done and sign up for the email or the text or the money if you want to support making this happen through Patreon. And then Thursdays, I do the show 7 p.m. Pacific, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern here on Instagram Live. Obviously, you know that because you're here with me right now. Um, and the shows are slightly different in terms of their format because of the way the technology works. So this is a little more riffing, monologue, and playing playing with y'all. Um, and this is season one of Live on Lockdown. And I, I say this every time. I do not want multiple seasons of the show. If you're a powerful network executive looking to throw money around, maybe you work for like Quibi or something. I heard y'all giving out shows. We don't need multiple seasons of Live on Lockdown. This should be one of those one and done things. Because we, you know, restore our democracy, get our infrastructure, our procurement shit in order, and squash this virus. That's what I'm really hoping for. Because multiple seasons of this show means something else has failed terribly. So what I am uh, going to do is uh, ask if you have a topic that you want me to address, or you have a direct question that you want to ask, there is a question mark bubble uh, kind of the question sticker at the very bottom of your screen, tap that, type in the topic or the question, and I will dig through those. And I'll give you a demonstration of how it works now. So I asked before the show what people might want me to talk about. And uh, here's one that came in. And the question is, is it ethical to shop online during this time? Uh, I would say that it is not only ethical, it is the only way to shop right about now in terms of the public health orders that we're getting. But I think inside of this question is kind of a deeper question about concentrations of wealth and power and monopolies. And should we give all our money to Jeff Bezos? I feel like what she's really saying is like, can I spend money on someone other than Jeff Bezos? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, Eliza Io, Eliziao. I see that as Eliza Yao. That's how I'm going to say your username, Eliza. Um, so yes, shopping online is ethical and right. But we are finding out there are ways to still support local businesses when doing it. So I'm here in Highland Park in Los Angeles. What's up, Northeast LA, if you're nearby. And there are the local grocers are starting to do curbside pickup. Many of the local restaurants are taking their relationships with the farmers and offering produce and almost like a CSA type program where you can buy a bin of vegetables or, or, or just a, a bunch of beets if you're like really into into beets. I'm fixated on the word beets right now. So I'm just going to say beets one more time. But you can start to buy your produce from them. Um, I think for some of the other items, if you're ordering things that are kind of less essential, like for example, microphones that plug directly into your iPhone so that your audio is superior to other Instagram live hosts, there that's an online only type of purchase and the local electronic shop does not have an online presence as far as i've been able to tell uh, so if, if other people have thoughts about 
this question, please uh, tap it out and I will, you know, scroll through and see, pick, pick up something or riff on it. Or you can obviously scroll through on your own and, and answer to this. Uh, Jen Nichols says, what about hot tubs? So if you're going to order a hot tub online, I, I've always subscribed to the idea that the best hot tub is, is the one you make. And so what you really want to do, uh, you don't need to like order a hot tub. You need to get yourself a shovel and a hose and some fire. And with those three simple ingredients, you can make your own hot tub. You have a bonding experience for your family. You work out some calories. Uh, Karen Khan, Karen Khan, hello, welcome to the show. Karen says, buy stuff on iFundWomen and support Main Street Women Entrepreneurs. That is what I'm talking about. That is a great example of being able to shop online, but still kind of direct where the money goes and, uh, and direct the money, uh, as I like to say, around the Bezos. We want to direct our money around the Bezos uh, because there it turns out there are other places that money can live uh, besides inside uh, of his uh, large skull. So let me just go back and see if anyone else threw something else. We talked, we addressed the hot tub situation. That's good. Season two, Democracy Restored. That is, that is a great idea. No one saw me enjoy this idea from Nine Hazels. Again, whenever people put numbers in their username, I'm like, what happened to the others? The first eight Hazels didn't work out? Or is there something magical about Nine Hazels? Uh, but thank you for this question. I'm going to clear the question and, uh, and come back just to you. We got Jossie Cunningham in the house. What's up, trainer, bro? Uh, I'm not going to do what I did last time because I'm wearing a sweater like last time. Last time Jossie jumped on the uh, jumped into the room, jumped on the stream. I don't even know. Last time Jossie showed up, let's be generic about it. Uh, I decided to plank. I had just done my census online, and I felt the need to prove myself before uh, a man much more fit than me. It's, it was a very mature response, and so I held my plank for what felt like five hours, but allegedly was forty-seven seconds, and I began to release liquids uh, from my face in, in an act. Uh, that, that some people call sweating. And I just released these liquids very wildly. So glad to have you here. Uh, good, good person. Ooh, shopblack.com, Erica and Philly. So we're going to stay on this topic of shopping online in a way that's ethical and puts moves the money around the Bezos. Uh, shop with the, that's the old school shoppy. That's S-H-O-P-P-E, which is a really nice segue to one of the topics I wanted to hit y'all with. Personal protective equipment. Let's talk about PPE uh, and the failures of our allegedly developed nation. So I, I saw this uh, wonderful graphic this week uh, posted by Mona Chalabi on her Instagram page. I'm gonna see if I can pull that up uh, to share with you. And we're gonna get into some of the topics that I wanted to uh, discuss slash shout at you uh, because such is the nature of this medium that I'm kind of in charge. So I pull this up and then I try to make my phone yoink. Okay. So Mona put this chart up. Hospital beds per 1,000 people. And you've got a, a corner of an orange circle for developing economies and a purple circle, a purple for developed economies. And in the caption, uh, Mona asks, do you really still think that the US is developed? That adjective hasn't made sense for a long time, but COVID-19 has demolished the myth. These charts are from a piece I published today. Here's a short extract. Um, and so she, she is, uh, she's doing that thing that, that people do sometimes, which is like, uh, what do you call it? Telling the truth and you know, I, I, this moment is revealing a lot of underlying lack uh, and, and truth in terms of our ability to respond to this because we don't have the number of hospital beds. We're failing to deliver the PPE on the back end of shop, shoppyblack.com. Uh, Thank you again, Erica, for that. Uh, so check out Mona Chalabi's piece, M-O-N-A-C-H-A-L-A-B-I. And uh, you can probably, you'll recognize the chart as you search Instagram for it later yes meyer good 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 a hole and a stick no need for a shovel okay that's that's great so yeah mona uh hooked us up with that uh depressing 
but factual chart. And I think staying on the topic for a moment, um, the U.S. Has, is really our number one motto is we're number one. What we're number one at most of the time is saying we're number one. <laughs> and then when you start to look underneath uh, of that, what, what are we supposedly number one at? We're, we're not really, you know, whether it's test scores or uh, income inequality or the happiness factor in terms of how satisfied people are to live in a society. But I think in this moment, the myth of kind of city on a hill, American supremacy, uh, coming up a little short, coming up a little short, just like our supply of personal protective equipment for our frontline health workers is coming up a little short. So hopefully on the other side of this, in season two, the democracy restored season, thank you, Nine Hazels, uh, we can get a little closer to the rhetoric. Um, and certainly we can maybe slow our roll on talking down to other nations. I'm reminded, seeing, uh, seeing Mark in here reminded me of one of our classmates, Robin, uh, who, you know, I've heard this story many times of people who were traveling back to the U.S. in the past month from overseas. And basically, it's the same story. The story is uh, country X had robust screening at their airports in terms of temperature checks, in terms of questioning your contacts and where you've been and your level of exposure. And then America was just like open borders for the virus, you know, and no hand washing, no hand sanitizer by TSA, no spacing in the lines. And so I, I've heard that uh, people returning from very developed European countries to developing nations like Ghana. Uh, so again, Mona's chart sort of gives us an excuse to talk about that. Uh, yeah, we are good at making the rich richer. Preach on, Karen Khan. Preach on. And, and thank you again for the contribution about uh, I fund women. Uh, no, America's number one in, in ass hattery. I like that. America's number one. What else is America? What else is America number one at? Just go nuts. Go nuts in the comments. I'll, I'll pick my favorites. Uh, meanwhile, I'll say what's up to Kyrie. What's happening? Long time no see. Good to see you in the room. Uh, and I am going to cycle through. We're number one at obesity in certain measures. That's for sure. Uh, we, uh, we are number one. Let's see what I can find. Oh, that's an interesting question. All right, we're going to get to that in a second. My ex-girlfriend took an emergency flight from Morocco, and the people there were telling her she was safer there. Yeah, that's 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 real. That's real. Myth destroyer. That's what coronavirus is. It is a myth destroyer. Um, and it's not just uh, in America. I think any government, any company, any household, any business, we are all being pushed to uh, an edge here and, and being revealed. Um, I, I cited this before, but Priya Parker called this a social x-ray. And, and so a lot is revealed. I think individually, you know, things about us are being revealed in terms of how we show up. Uh, under duress and under stress and how we you know, treat other people can be pushed to an edge positively or, or negatively. Uh, number one at money laundering. Yo, is it? I don't know. I don't know if the U.S. is number one at money laundering. I feel like it depends on how you, this is going to sound shady, but how exactly do you define money laundering? <laughs> and I'm not saying that because I'm secretly running a criminal operation. I'm openly running a criminal operation, but uh, I'm saying that because it's, like because of the Panama Papers, right? Like all that money laundering was happening in Panama. Like, do they get the credit, or is it based on the citizenship of the clientele? In which case, maybe Russia becomes the number one money laundering. You know, you, it's all about like where you. It's the technicality, and that's how people get off. I'm going to be a great defense lawyer. I'm going to do real good if we ever have courts again. America's number one at uh, denying and ignoring facts. Ooh. Ooh, sick burn. Okay, so let me move on to uh, a question. Got a question. Welcome, welcome. If you're just joining, you're watching live on lockdown. I'm Baratunde Thurston. I do the show here on Instagram every Thursday night, and I take your questions as well as share my thoughts uh, and try to have a little bit of fun. So let's throw this up on the screen. The Meyer Sleeve wrote, which positive societal changes will persist after the crisis. 
So I'm going to take a shot at answering this question, but I'm learning with y'all. If you have thoughts on this, throw them in the feed uh, so because you, you can engage with each other and kind of see how, how that goes um, and, and talk to each other while I talk at you. So which positive societal changes will persist after the crisis? So I guess I'm going to be very analytical and break it down like, okay, what positive societal changes will happen, whether or not they persist? And I think we are seeing this mode, like after a lot of tragedies, post 9-11, post tornadoes and hurricanes, of neighbors checking in with each other. Um, we have a, a very local text message group just of like the couple blocks around us. And somebody got a delivery of extra food and they asked, do, does anyone know anyone who needs this, especially any of like our elder neighbors? And then I checked in with one of the elder neighbors who I've kind of adopted during this. And she was like, well, normally I eat organic stuff, but you know, I'll take it. Thank you so much. And so just like localized kindness and looking out for each other is probably on the increase overall as we are depending on each other in new ways. Um, I also think many of us know the names of our mayors and governors more than we ever did before <laughs> because they're on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter streaming at us every single day. And that's a good thing. Like we should know who our elected officials are. Maybe after the crisis, we don't need to hear from them all day, every day, quite like that. But um, that, that could be a, a good thing. And I think the understanding of the fragility of our economic system is, is a positive change because we lived in ignorance of how brittle this just-in-time economy we built was. And now we are, we are recognizing both kind of technical supply chain stuff, but also the, the human value chain and people who we assume have values uh, have value, not have values, but have value to us, have value to society. Like, who do we protect? Who do we put on the pedestal? Oh, big fancy business person who looks like this or an investor or a venture capitalist. And it turns out in this moment, it's your you know mail clerk, right? It's, it's your letter carrier. It's the janitor. It's the bus driver. It's the grocery store person. It's the bank teller that is deemed essential and who you get really upset with if they can't get you your pasta in time because you need pasta or you will die. Uh, so a recognition of human value beyond what's been promoted uh, is something that's certainly happening. I, I don't, I don't know how much will persist. I mean, we had, we've been through this before we went through nine 11 and we thought kindness would persist and we became very cruel again as a nation. Um, and we thought eye contact would persist in a city like New York. And it lasted like a good 20 months of eye contact and then we all were just like, I'm busy again and I don't need to look at you. And now I got AirPods uh, and, and Candy Crush. So uh, we didn't have those at 9-11. We invented them after so we wouldn't have to face our fellow human anymore. And we keep being given opportunities to see each other and we accept them and then we kind of decline them. So I, I'm, I won't predict what will stick, but I hope that we will build uh, in the face of the brittle economic system we have, we'll build something more resilient in the face of our lack of local community and connection, we will maintain the communities that we are building now out of necessity because we'll realize that we actually need them uh, all the time. Now, I'm going to go back and see what you all have said while I've been making up stuff off the top of, of my head. Uh, Karen says, I think people are going to be kinder. And, and I, I hope you are right. I know you're right in the short term. I hope you're right in the long term. I think because history has happened in so many different iterations, I would have to be a, kind of a dick and ask, like, are we kinder now than we were a thousand years ago? Eh, I don't know. I wasn't around, but I, 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 I suspect not. I suspect there's a kind of a human nature thing that we re resort to. People coming together to help one another, hopefully. Yep. Empathy would be really nice. Work from home no longer and look down upon by coworkers. Reach C. Hollinger. I really like that one because there's definitely been folks who get cast aspersioned on <laughs> for working from home. And, you know, people put air quotes around it. And now we all have to do it. And I think we're proving that we can. And, and to, you, to answer you, uh, Meyer, in, in this question, the idea of... Um, some things 
that will persist. We won't necessarily fall back, right? We are being pushed into some innovations that I think will stick. Like I think a lot of the um, ability to do things remotely, whether it's file for unemployment or order groceries or educate children or run a company meeting, I don't think we're just going to snap back to like the analog days. You know, once you have a cell phone, you don't go back to the rotary landline dial. And whether you chose to have the phone or your boss made you have it or your parents gave it to you, it's kind of a part of your culture and tradition now. So I think there are some cultural things that will not shift back and not always for the better, but they won't shift back. And education is like a really interesting one. Um, and I think, you know, some institutions may not last out of this. And I'm, I don't know which of those would be good for us to not persist, but I suspect there will be not just stories of woe, but maybe some predatory lenders won't make it through. I'd be real excited about that um, if they couldn't take advantage of people. Oh, Shadow Glenn Vermont just drops a one word response. This is going to deliver this with the appropriate in response to which positive societal changes will persist after the crisis. Glenn says, nature. And and Glenn, probably you just, you dropped the mic in my head because it's, it's true. Uh, nature is uh, taking over parts of the backyard as we speak, and they're not giving up without a fight. These squirrels are grabbing territory. I mean, this is like an epic game of risk, and humans are down versus all the other species who are like, finally, finally, we get to reclaim What's ours? Less posturing, structures for routine and self-care. I, I hope that that is true, Meyer. I think we, um, you know, I, I interviewed AOC. I'm going to overclaim the moment that happened last week when I got a question in just like you did with me on her IG Live. But she talked about how we value people and how we have in, in a capitalist society limited that value to um, economic value. And in a moment where literally millions and millions, 10% of the U.S. workforce cannot work. And it's probably more than that, but that's what we know, that we will value people for more than their economic output. It would be so beautiful if that persisted in an Elizabethan, Warrenish kind of way uh, past this moment. Uh, for a moment, our politicians are behaving like grown-ups. <laughs> that's, uh, depends on which politician we're talking about, Mishak. Uh, Cabe McGivney says, historically, after a pandemic, wealth inequality shrinks. Yeah, but none of those societies were America right now with Mitch McConnell in charge of the Senate. So that's sort of a, on the one hand, on the other kind of situation. I'm not prepared to predict the end of wealth inequality. Um, but you know what? No, I'm going to tip to the side of that because I also think for those who didn't see it as a problem, it's in our faces now. It's in many more people's faces what happens when you have so many vulnerable folks in society and we're all put at risk by the um, circumstances of our most vulnerable population. That, that I would love to see our sort of interconnectivity and recognition last. <laughs> Nine Hazels coming through. Super rich who escaped to yachts during the crisis need to stay at sea. <laughs> Y'all are a trip. Hank Willis Thomas in the house. What's up, brother? I don't know if you're still here, but thank you. Thank you. Uncoupling healthcare from employment. We got R. Weber Jr. Hello, Reginald. Welcome to the show. This is live on lockdown, episode seven. And we've got folks all over at least the U.S., uh, probably other nations as well. But uncoupling healthcare from employment. Yes, this is one of those moments where I'm not just going to say, well, history happens and we always just resort to some bullshit. Um, I think the absurdity of tying your you know, physical, mental well-being to your boss is revealed in this moment, much like the myth of developed countries always being better than developed to go back to the Mona Chalabi chart. So with that myth now busted, can we persist in a more truth, truthful way that everyone's deserving of quality health and we have enough to make that happen and literally we're all healthy when we're all healthy you know it doesn't do any good to have like a sort of a mostly healthy society but like but only 10 percent have the super virus well yeah we're all connected 
through the Uber drivers and the postal service and the restaurants and, you know, the air we breathe. So, yeah, separating healthcare from employment, maybe it'll have taken the unnecessary, preventable and rapid death of many members of our society to bring that chapter in our national history to its close. Uh, oh, Mishak says, so many people are dealing with reduced productivity, so I think that might taint the perception of work from home. Yeah. But when we work from home in the future, we won't also be terrified of every moment of every day uh, because it won't be pandemic times forever. So I'm, I'm hoping that will kind of balance out. Mamukia, hello, welcome. Thank you for joining. Um, and my gut tells me that all the noise of our lives, including political actors, manipulations, might be seen as a factor in us not being prepared and also slower to act. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Uh, and then Erica in Philly, always dropping these little truth bombs, says you have to read N.K. Jemison's short story, Emergency Skin. What happens when society's most evolved leave the planet? Yo, and I'm guessing it's not like Elon Musk's best friends who are most evolved. <laughs> uh, so thank you for weighing in on this question about positive societal changes that will persist. I'm going to clear that, clear the slate, go back into the pile. This is fun. Ooh, look at all these questions. Y'all are getting the game. Okay, so let's go. Okay, so Karen had asked this question. I'll just We kind of talked about it, but I want to put your face on the screen, give you some credit. Do you think that people are going to come out of this quarantine experience Kinder, nicer, gentler. Um, some of us will. Weather will remain that way. Will remain to be seen. But also, Karen, uh, some people will come out of this meaner, uh, crueler, and harsher. And I think, you know, threat of loss of physical security doesn't always just bring out the best, right? It brings out uh, selfishness and a hoarding. My sister shared something of uh, a right-leaning politician in a state west of the Mississippi. I cannot remember which one or, or his name, but it was uh, advocating for, oh no, it was, it was in Georgia, actually. It was the, the messaging about buy up for folks in the suburbs, buy up your guns, make sure you have all the ammo you need before the looters from Atlanta come and take all of our shit. Uh, and so the excuse to hunker down and point all your weaponry outward is also present. And I think in this country in particular, because we, we have such a, a, a amount of fear in our society and such ready access to weapons, that Venn diagram overlap uh, doesn't always lead to kinder, nicer, gentler. Um, it can lead to, well, in, like in the past, it can lead to vilification. I think we are seeing uh, the cruelty and, and meanness, the opposite of what you're hoping for, toward Asians right now and Asian Americans right now. Someone texted me uh, a, an image that was put up in her neighborhood, a place of work before things were shut down, essentially blaming this whole thing on any nearest Asian seeming person. And that happened after 9-11 too. Like, yes, New Yorkers made eye contact, but also people killed six, you know, and those of that religious faith thinking they were Muslims. Uh, so, so best of times, worst of times type situation. Uh, Karen, thank you for asking that. And let me go back into the pile and just make this. I, I definitely prepared all. I have like eight topics on my little hit list, but I like responding to you more. So let's keep it responsive. Uh, this is from the Daniel Isaiah. Hello, Daniel Isaiah asks, how can art, literature, music, film help us make sense of this crisis? Good question. Have at it uh, amongst yourselves in the comments while I do press conference style spin doctorship uh, and just sort of think about this uh, out loud. I mean, look, art, art always, uh, that's what art is there to do. So how it's going to happen, we will see over time. Some of what I'm seeing already is uh, a, a lot of innovation, a lot of beauty. The Russian ballet did something in the past few days where they performed but remotely, each dancer in their home, in their kitchen, fanning themselves with household items like plates. The New York Philharmonic did a, uh, a bolero uh, from Ravel. 
where they all recorded individually. Many of you probably saw this beautiful viral moment. Um, oh, we can't say that anymore. Well, I said it. it the word has many. It meant that anyway. From uh, the Hamilton performance for the little girl on uh, John Krasinski's Some Good News show, where the whole cast of Hamilton did this really beautiful remote synced performance uh, of one of the, the, the title tracks from, uh, from that musical. And I saw a, a museum put out a call for people to recreate their favorite paintings. They would basically post a painting and then say, with whatever you find in your house, uh, recreate that. And folks got very innovative. Uh, innovative. I don't know why I said it that way. And useless. Oh, I was trying to see if I had it in my web queue. But uh, sad and useless. That was the website. And it was, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for y'all because it is, it is fun. But this is what happens. And you just let me like web browse I'm trying to find a thing. Ah, uh, here it is. It was the Getty Museum right here in Los Angeles. So let me just uh, kind of set this up. Okay. We're going to get janky with it. Let's angle that down. Maybe uh, raise that a little bit. And so you see they asked, sorry, in the mic, we challenge you to recreate a work of art uh, with the people in your home. And here's some of what people did. Oh, wait a minute. I have to click it. I know how to internet. <laughs> Here we go. So, right, you've got this painting, and then they recreated it like that. I mean, that's cool, right? Um, very famous, but now you do it with, like, baloney. That's great. And actually really accurate. This is my favorite by far. This dog is owning this painting. Like, I would say better than the original. So that's pretty cool. This classic, I feel like I'm suspicious of the high production values of this recreation. That's just like, you just happen to have all that stuff in your house. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm believing that. And it continues, it continues like, like that. Uh, all right, so back to me and you. Go, shiny forehead. Okay. Um, as comedy has been great outlet. Ooh, SNL is going to happen this weekend? I didn't even know that. How are they going to do that? The pub choir video was amazing. I don't even know what that is. Uh, Mishak, text it to me, <laughs> please. And uh, Erica asks, how are we supporting independent artists without demanding they perform on demand and entertain us with no guarantee? Yes, Erica, how are we doing that without expecting that they perform on demand and entertain us with no guarantee? <laughs> uh, there's a, a group called Harness, which has been, oh, wait, 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 no, Pop Culture Collaborative. They are offering grants to artists, popcollab.com or .org, uh, to independent artists who have been hit hard by this thing, $500,000 grants to just help their work continue. So that's one specific effort that I'm aware of. And there are folks looking at how the um, various stimulus acts apply to artists. And I don't have the answers just right here, but I know that that work is, uh, is being done. All right, I'm going to clear the Daniel Isaiah's question. Let's go back into the pile and see what else we got. Uh, I think, Nina, we kind of talked about this. I want to acknowledge. Thank you for asking. Uh, do you think the pandemic and gross medical care inequities will contribute to pushing forward health care reform? I do. I do. I think it's very hard to go back um, and say, no, no, just employer-based insurance. And if you don't have insurance, it's because you don't want it. It's like nobody wants to be without a net in a, in a moment like this. So this kind of reveals the great need. And I think there was one more in here uh, from Niall Walsh. What do you make of the diminished inclusion of education, specifically the humanities, in our country's focal point? 
Seems like many issues we've encountered. Uh, I don't, I might not, I, I put the question up before I fully understood it and it's longer than fits in the little box. So I'm having some limitations. Let me just pause for a minute. Hmm. Yeah, Niall, maybe uh, just throw it in the comments so I can actually try to address it. Um, oh, man. I'm trying to get rid of that. Learning while scrolling. That's the life we live. Okay, so while uh, while I wait for Niall to do that, let me just throw out a... <laughs> I wrote down three questions <laughs> um, that have been on my mind uh, lately. We have maybe 10-ish 10, minutes left in this. Uh, time for a sip of brown juice. Mmm, brown shoes. It helps the pandemic go down. All right. So uh, the three questions I wrote, uh, where are my libertarians at? That was question one. Because I just, I for some reason, and maybe it's just my online circles, I'm not hearing a lot of calls for small government right now. I don't know if anybody out there hearing from, where's Grover Norquist right now? Talking about trying to shrink the federal government down to the point where you could drown it in a bathtub. I'm just not hearing that kind of rhetoric anymore. Now, maybe, again, I'm not looking in the right places. I don't hang out at Reason Magazine. But I suspect that maybe those types of people are shutting their face holes because they need the federal government to save their assholes. That's what I'm thinking might be happening. That's just, you know, just riffing on that uh, a bit. Uh, where, where are... Um, where are the anti-vaxxers right now? Where got to be awkward to be an anti-vaxxer in this moment where every human soul on the planet is praying for a vaccine, even those who don't pray because they want to go to a baseball game again or a cricket match or a soccer slash football match at some point in the future. Not hearing too much. Again, I don't, I don't really hang out at anti-vax.biz, but you, know, you let me know. Where what you're hearing from these people? Because I just feel like you had a good run, anti-vaxxers. You you got uh, you know some celebs out of it, like Jenny McCarthy. You trended online on Twitter and Facebook for a little bit, had your your 15 minutes and milked it. But we're done with you now. We don't need you. Your fun in the sun is over. And and when the vaccines come, maybe you're just like last in line. Because, you know, assuming you believe all the things you were saying you believed after all this time, uh, I just I'm not hearing from the anti-vaxxers in this particular moment. Uh, the other question I ask, will the vegans win? And I ask that because uh, I was reading through a white paper. It's kind of what I do to pass the time. I don't have kids, so I read white papers. And I was talking about, you know, animal-human transmission and the history of all kinds of viruses. You know, these flus are named for animals, right? We had the bird flu and the swine flu. And this coronavirus came from animal slaughter in a wet market in China. Where's the vegetable flu? Like, where's the carrot flu? Where's the squash virus? I'm, have we ever had uh, a malicious virus leap from tree to human, I, I, are, are we in fear of our you know, little cacti and other shrubs of our azalea bushes and bougainvilleas? I don't think so. I think the plants just give us life. But these animals are like, back up off me. I tried to warn you. I told you I had consciousness. Now I'm coming for your respiratory tract. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe the vegans should be given... A higher seat at the table maybe we should remove the seat for the anti-vaxxer remove the chair for the libertarian and stock it up with two vegans how about that and like a universal health care person i just want to rearrange the table of influence that determines our society because when we started listening to the libertarian type voice it came in the form of a proud nazi defender steve bannon who said and i quote I'm all about that deconstruction of the administrative state. Remember Steve Bannon? Remember when everybody was just like all up on him, just dying to have him on their tech or media platform because he was this wise, sage elder because he forgot how to shave. 
and took credit for shit he didn't even do. But he's a white dude who looked kind of authoritative, so I guess he knows what he's talking about. And what he was talking about is what we're living in now. This is the deconstruction of the administrative state. When the U.S. federal government cannot muster its might and power and will to defend its citizens from a common enemy. People die. That's what Steve Bannon was talking about. Death. He's like a freaking death eater from a fictional universe. But he's a part of our universe and he had real influence over real power in this real nation. So these are just some of the thoughts. That's my mini little monologue. Let me go back, check back in with you, see what's popping in the comments. All right. Oh, yeah, and where are the folks who want to keep their insurance? Ah, okay, I got your question now. I'll come back to that. Ooh, double hands up. Thank you, people. And bougie pangolin ranches and uh -huh, plants are all about that. E. coli. Oh, E. coli. Yo. He was a white dude. Looked like everyone's drunkle. Steve Bannon looked like bad Santa. That's on. That's the honest truth. I uh, I have a graphic that I made of that at some point, but I don't even want to put his face in your face. That's I respect you too much uh, to do that to, to y'all. So Niall's question, he uh, Niall expl expanded in uh, the comments. Just curious as to how you feel about how downplayed the humanities are these days compared to business, profits, etc. Yes. Um, I don't feel great about it. I think when I was a kid, math and science was just starting to trend in terms of educational priorities. I was born in 77, graduated high school in 95, and I myself was a math and science kid right up until I got to college and I majored in philosophy. And at the time, I was like, yo, it was jobs. You know, it was good jobs. You can get paid well, become a doctor, become an engineer, be like a black engineer was like a thing. Maybe go to Georgia Tech and Morehouse. And I don't think that was wrong. And I think having... I think science is good. <laughs> I'm going to go out on the limb, y'all, and just risk my political future and say, I think science is good. And yet, or, or in addition to, I think the humanities gives us a different window into our condition. And there are studies on the humanities side of things that also challenge power in a way that STEM doesn't. And I'm not a full-blown conspiracy theorist, but I do think those in power were more comfortable not encouraging young people to ask these deep philosophical questions about the nature of power and who holds it in society, and instead just like crank on those math problem sets and build me a rocket to Mars, kid. Go, target these ads, my G. So um, yeah, I don't feel that great about it. And I also think we've relied a lot in our political society on like business is good and competent and to be emulated and government is like bad and lazy and to be derided. And no, they're both human institutions and neither of them has a monopoly on incompetence. Government can be super whack, super late to the game, super non-innovative, but so can mad businesses. And businesses can be corrupt, uh, can be abusive of their employees, can be absolutely greedy and selfish and not in the public interest, but only in the profit interest. And that's not good for the public. So I think these extremes are just not healthy. Um, and so I, I'm not for like an all stem everything, nor am I for like poetry nonstop, 24-7. Welcome to that poetry life. Fuck numbers. You know, like that's not me either. I'm, I'm in the happy medium between like all poetry all the time and like, yo, let's let's do some calculus. Let's let's calculate some integrals. Uh, that's that's where I would put my ideal society. Niall, thank you for your for your question. All right, we are coming to a, a, a near close on this because I want to keep these to under an hour because last time my whole stream got destroyed because Instagram just like shut it down, probably because we were talking all this humanities. Uh, so let me just check back in with y'all, see what's up. STEM does require an ethical basis. Excellent point, Meyer. Uh, okay, uh, we agree. Equalize bacteria, all the virus. This is mentioned come from animals. Yes. Okay. So the viruses are the animals trying to tell us to back up off me and focus on your veggies. Dynamite Soul asks, so you're a philosopher? I mean, when you put it that way, why yes. Yes, I am. I don't, it's funny because I don't think having a degree in philosophy makes me a philosopher, but I'm going to take it. 
I'm a I'm because there are people who go to grad school and get the PhD, and I think maybe they get to call themselves philosophers. But whatever, I'm a philosopher now. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, so let me go back to my little list and see if there's anything else that was on me mind. <laughs> I have some. I pulled some lines from a a Harvard white paper I read today that I thought I might share with you. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can just start reading a white paper at you, but I will share a, a, a sad um, thought that I've had about what the cost of this thing is. Maybe I'll pop it back up to the positive before I leave you, but it is on the nature of loneliness and life. And because of the friend I mentioned who had this very lonely childbirth experience, and because of my, the friend of my sister who passed, who had a very lonely end of life experience. It occurred to me that what this virus is doing is um, making it so that people's first and last days are entirely alone. And that's that's not natural. That's not our most human, certainly not humane, to enter the world alone and be sort of separated from your immediate, much less extended family, from the people who want to visit and bring food and to die alone in a hospital with a healthcare worker, cell phoning. Uh, making a cell phone call to your family member. It just, you know, there's something about that loneliness on the way in and the way out that this virus uh, caused me to reflect on as like, it's not a big number. It's not like this number of unemployed, it's not trillions of dollars of economic harm. But I think there is some meaning in that. I think there's some tragedy in it, not not exclusively, but mostly. And it just hit me as like important. Like that is an important fact of of the moment of coronavirus uh, and and COVID nineteen, and that was me philosophizing. Voila! <laughs> okay, we got three minutes on the clock, and uh, yeah, you do have to remember to tune in next week. So why don't I do a, a communications plug right now? Thank you for joining. If you just joined, hi, I'm Paratunde. You're in my shed. Um, this is a show called Live on Lockdown. I do it twice a week. Sundays, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. Thursdays, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. Um, Sundays are on Zoom. Thursdays, they hear our IG. If you go to baratunde.com slash live, you can see the, the archive of all of these, including the Instagram ones. Uh, and if you text me, you can get real-time alerts as to when I go live, and I can tell you happy birthday when it's your birthday because I care that much, uh, and we can have a back-and-forth exchange. So that number... All those links are accessible in my Instagram uh, bio link. You tap that and it explodes into a a potpourri of possibility uh, of ways to connect. Uh, And I do a weekly email that I call Recommend Tune Day where I share uh, ways that people are navigating the world in a way that will make it better. Uh, Previously, a focus on race, tech, uh, climate. Um, Now it's focused on... uh, coronavirus because that subsumes all the other ones and and we see race and tech and climate through this and so i guess my dismount will be about the race thing Uh, i I was very angry in my email newsletter this week because it became clearer who was bearing the burden of this pandemic and it became very fashionable to say this virus comes for all of us and it does it comes for all of us but it it reaches us in different ways and there was a lot of breaking news this week Uh, What I put in the category, breaking news, racism, in terms of how this plays out in the United States. And and breaking news, racism and poverty are comorbidities. And why do black people suffer more from the coronavirus? It's not a genetic thing. Uh, It's lack of access to health care. It's living in more polluted areas, which weaken lungs and immune systems. It's lack of access to healthy food because of systemic and structural racism that's been built up over generations. It's discrimination within the healthcare system where people don't take our pain seriously. It's suspicion of said healthcare system because of a history of people not taking our pain seriously. And it is terrible. Uh, And it is very painful to see. And uh, there are all kinds of conspiracy theories that fly around certain communities because of the history of real conspiracies against those communities. And it's just a commingled uh, bag of shit. And it's, it's very painful to see um, on top of the agony that this thing is causing that we have an inner agony that we could have been working on uh, to make this better. So what's really nice 
um, is that we are aware that we're starting to count that certain cities are trying to be on it. And on the other side of this, which will come, we will get to another side. We will have yet another opportunity to try to make this stuff right and make it better and maybe have more urgency uh, on that mission and fewer excuses not to. Because we can say racism kills. We can say poverty kills. We can say deconstruction of the administrative state kills. And death is not something you can come back from. You can come back from a political argument, right? You'd be like, oh, you got me. That was all good debate points. Robert's rules. You got me. But when someone's dead, there's no coming back from that. And some of these deaths are preventable because we didn't fix some of the upstream problems of poverty and and race and uh, other factors that are much more in our control. So thank you so much for joining me. Uh, This has been Live on Lockdown Season 1, hopefully the last one, Episode 7, more to come. You can find me at baratunde.com slash live. You can text me at 202-894-8844. And I want to especially thank those who ask questions, who are talking amongst yourselves right now, even while I am talking at you. Tell your friends, send a direct message, uh, turn notifications on my IG so that you get notified when I do these again. I will always do the Thursday night one. Sometimes I do a spontaneous one, daytime, just to mix up the programming. I, I just like cooked one day, uh, just to be weird, and it was fun. And uh, I showed off my apron. I have a, really, have a really good apron. You could use it like with an ax or with a chef's knife. I'm not gonna tell you which. Uh, but I gotta go. Thank you for showing up. I'm gonna try to save this to my feed so you can watch it later.